Um, so this is uh, an introduction to Monroe's motivated sequence to kick off our section on uh, the persuasive speech. So let me quick read what is required for the speech from your syllabus. You'll find that detail in your syllabus. This is 20% of your grade goes into this speech, very similar to the informative speech, six to eight minute speech based on the subject guidelines provided by your instructor, that's me. Um, it requires scholarly library research, I mean, or a variety of good quality sources, let's say. Long form outline um, with in-text citations and a works cited reference page, a one page short form outline, a PowerPoint presentation, and effective classroom delivery. All right, so Monroe's motivated sequence. It was developed way back when my grandpa was a little boy. So it was developed by a, a fella named Alan Monroe in the in the mid 30s. Um, and there's a there's a presentation I watched and I included a link at the back of this um, deck for you to check out. It's on YouTube uh, by another communications uh, coach that I found really helpful in walking you through um, some of the psychology behind uh, this framework. Um, and you know it helped me, so hopefully you'll you'll um, enjoy it as well. Um, but one of the things he says in this video is that not all topics in the persuasive area of speaking fit very well into this approach. And I really appreciated that because um, you know one it's one of the things I'm required to teach you guys, and it's it's been around forever. It's it's you know the sort of the you know the bumpers on the car. It's sort of the, I don't even think that's an analogy, but you know, it's, it's the basics. It's the bare bones of how to do a persuasive speech. Um, so you should learn it, but not everything conforms to this methodology. So, or framework, right? So, um, it's really, to me, it's really great for the classic sales pitch. Um, and you might have a persuasive argument that it's not really a sales pitch. It doesn't really have a hard call to action. Well, it should have a hard call to action, but it's not about, um, it's not so linear, I guess, is a way to put it, that it's going to conform to this. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, if the topic that you chose isn't so conducive to this approach, I'll go ahead and let you use the other speech planner um, that we've been using for your informative speech, um, which could also be adapted quite easily for a persuasive argument. Persuade us ultimately to some sort of an action or some sort of a, um, a shift in how we see the world, right? So for example, the informative speech, you know, you sat there and you had really good quality research coming at you and, um, you know, you, you would be left with as an audience uh, this this feeling of, huh, I didn't know that. I learned something new that was really valuable to me. That's sort of the whole objective of an informative speech. Persuasion, as I've as I set up for most of you in class already, persuasion's a different animal in that you want to move people. You want to start to inspire them or, you know, get the get the wheels turning so like, hmm, this could be really, that's really interesting. I think I'm going to do something about it. I think I'm going to take some action in my life. I'm going to make a change or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm inspired to, um, you know, to, to act on, on something you just said. So, um, you know, that's, that's the ultimate idea. That's it. So it's a difference. So, you know, you want to get people, um, to actually adopt a new behavior or minimally an attitude shift as a result of your communication. So, okay, back to Monroe's motivated sequence. So this is kind of the straight up bare bones approach of like the classic sales pitch. So my grandfather, Grandpa Silka, he was the OG pitch man, the original gangsta, for those of you not cool enough to know what OG stands for. Um, yeah, so he used to actually call himself a pitch man. He sold everything. He sold furniture, um, mostly is what I remember, but he sold kind of uh, a bunch of stuff, which I'm about to get into with my... Um, fire alarm case study. Um, and you know, God, he was, he was a shill guy, right? So he was sort of a, um, unafraid of a, of a, of a hard conversation or, or a really tough, you know, like kind of a hard sell kind of a thing. So, uh, you know, we knew 
there was two two Johns. His name was John. There's two Johns in the furniture store, and he's like, you know what? Just call me Stan, just so you can differentiate. Uh, actually, Stan the man. So he was like kind of the original ad guy that you know inspired my career actually my father followed his uh, footsteps he became a salesman of every single thing that you can imagine I'm, I'm going back to the 70s is when I was growing up and kind of learning from these guys and my dad uh, God he sold um, he sold oh gosh so we're from the south side of Chicago so he sold wigs and pots um, he sold fire alarms. He sold, I think, typewriters, was, uh, encyclopedias for a while. I remember he used cars for a while. So he's, he's a good salesman, but he's a really just nice guy. I don't really think of my dad as the closer. I think of that's more grandpa's bag. Um, and so I went into advertising after that, um, inspired by, you know, everything around me. And I love TV and I love, you know, the whole world of communication so I go into that field, and I still see Monroe's motivated sequence used um, in in my field as well. For me, my I resisted a bit because it's really um, really conducive to a problem solution type of uh, quick sell, I guess you would say. You see it a lot in pharmaceutical advertising, right? You have restless leg syndrome, take this pill. You have uh, what overactive bladder you know actually the, the proper name is urinary incontinence but since we're advertising people we give it a name that people can understand so overactive bladder it's not even a medical term um but you have overactive bladder then you need to have you know see your doctor and ask ask for dish or pan um you know so so that's sort of the problem solution approach um it also you'll see it a lot in um direct response advertising which is it's an older model. It's like the 1-800 call now or, you know, act now and you'll get this and this and this bonus for free. And you see that a lot in the infomercials and in the um, anything that tries to create urgency is called direct response marketing. It's actually a lot cheaper than mass marketing to buy. So a lot of um, companies have gotten clever in how to, you know, work around it and use it in their advertising. So they qualify for the cheaper media buy. FYI, not that that's part of this. Um, yeah, so it's a lot to me. It's creatively uninspiring. You know, I look at that and I my head blows up because I am a creative as much as I am strategic. So I like to see things that are creatively interesting and thought provoking and um, helpful. And it's just when I see this model, it just kind of makes me fizzle as um, as somebody who's passionate about um, advertising communications. It's just a little bit too flat for me. Um, however, it does. It actually works. Um, the reason people buy DR, uh, sorry, direct response, and that and use this kind of a medium is it works. There's a lot of really good data to show people follow this model and they buy stuff. So, um, so there's something to be said for that. All right. So, what are the steps of Monroe's motivated sequence? As I said um, in class, uh, and those of you with the benefit of the handout, there are five steps from getting our attention all the way to getting people to act. So I'm going to go through each of these really quick here. Well, there's no quick with me. Let me just see what I can do. <laughs> uh, attention. So just like the informative speech, you guys, AGOs, don't just start. Hi, my name is, and my subject is, and blah, 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 blah. And then you launch right into your talking points for your speech. Boring, right? You're young people. You should be, you know, take a risk. Who's going to get you in trouble? I'm encouraging it, right? There's nothing, there's, there's nothing to, um, there's nothing to lose and you can only gain by being bold. So you want to think of your AGO as throwing, uh, uh, casting a line as far as you can hook us, right? Start to reel us in, be provocative, be interesting. It should be related to your topic, of course, but really get us like, whoa, this is going to be something I want to lean in on and I want to hear. Um, okay, so that's our attention. Now you have to set up the need. You got our attention. Why are we here? And as we're listening to you set up this need, you want us to be reacting. We're nodding our heads. We're seeing what you're saying. You know, and we feel like, yeah, I have that need. I could want this. All right, I'm tracking. Um, some of this, it's important for you to choose a topic 
that isn't so milk toast and that we're all like, yeah, of course. I mean, I believe I should have vegetables. <laughs> I mean, unless you're on keto, but right. Uh, you know, okay. You can make, you can make the sale for why you should eat healthy, but don't we kind of know that already? Right. So if your audience is already there and you're, you find yourself sort of preaching to the choir in your topic, you might not really have a very interesting or provocative topic. You know, so I would push you back to the drawing board a bit and find a different spin on it or, you know, change topics altogether. Or if you really like where you are, just find find some tension, find some something interesting, a new, a new way to look at it so that your audience can go somewhere with you. There's a reason you're taking them on this ride. Third, you want to satisfy the need. Okay, so they see they need it. Well, why are you going to, you know, why are you here? So what do you, what do you propose? You know, the planet's burning. We needed bo 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 watch Greta Thunberg and, you know, and see, you know, whatever, you know, but what is, what do we need to do about it? So, and, and you set that up in a way that's well supported with your research um, and well argued with, you know, where you've put it in your debate or what, not your debate, sorry. Um, you know, well argued with your examples and, um, you know, we could, we could, we could buy into this, this narrative. The next two points are everything that lives and dies in the next two points. Point four, visualization, point five, action. So I've seen people just blow it here. Like they got that far. They've done all the research, attention, need, satisfaction. People confuse satisfaction and visualization and they are kind of mushy they kind of go you know in and out of each other but the visualization part um how do you get to people to understand that this is a great idea help them imagine it help them imagine how their life would be somehow improved or better or you know enhanced or uh, whatever i'm using thesaurus words here but you get the idea right like this is a this is some new value in my life and you know at uh, only when they are enrolled in that idea that they can really buy into, you know, the thing would, you know, your solution is something that they can participate in, 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 you know, in a positive way, can you make the, the, um, the close, you know, have them take some action. No, you can't jump from point three to point five. Um, so this is the problem. Yeah, I get that. Here's the solution. So will you give me a hundred dollars? Um, no. Right. So you got to help, help me understand, help me imagine before I'm going to part with my money, my time, my life, my thoughts, my, uh, you know, support in any, you know, way, shape or form. I want to see this thing alive in my life. I want to imagine it. And I, and it's up to you to bring that, that to me, um, in your speech. So four is a critical step to get to five. Five, close the deal, you know, and and depending on how um, enrolled they are, how well you you covered off on uh, step four, that is an easy sell or it's a hard sell. If it starts feeling hard, you probably missed step four. All right, so let me go into an example. So Grandpa Silka and my father, Bob Silka, um, were part of the Four Minute Corporation back in the 70s, and I remember it very well from as a kid. Um, they had to sell these fire alarms. That's what fire alarms used to look like. In fact, I had one, we had one in every room of our house, every, over every doorway. Um, lovely, beautiful things, right? Um, but you know, Hey, they did the job and that's what it looked like back then. And, and, um, there was certainly a reason they existed. So, uh, their objective as you know, at this corporation is to get one of these bad boys over every door in your house. So they had to make sales calls. They had to, you know, have people see the value of having a fire alarm. Again, they're, they didn't exist before, you know, these clunking big honking machines, right? To see the point of it, see how it could help you. Um, and then how would you want to put that eyesore over every single door, right? So you have to somehow, you're not going to promote it on its beautiful features. You're going to promote it in different ways. How you can talk about it? Well, you know, you're going to get right to it. Fire kills you. And this is a, this is a way that you can prevent it. So let's walk through the model. So first get our attention. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. They, they actually had qualified leads, um, you know, where they actually had people through referral 
and word of mouth would say, yeah, I saw this presentation, go ahead and set me up for, you know, set, set my friend up down the road up for an appointment. Um, you know, and then you walked in. So it wasn't cold calls. People expected you to come into their house. This pitch, by the way, it took an hour. Um, so to have some stranger walk in your house, it, it was really a referral basis. I won't go into the details. If you ever take my advertising or PR class, um, they have a really good model in terms of how they got their leads, qualified leads, um, that paid off for them as a business. Um, and I could talk about this case study, but most case studies, like how that works in the, in the pipeline, in the sales pipeline. All right. So, so anyways, just do something. You want to get their attention at, at this level. You know that everybody's agreed by this point that, yeah, fire, fire kills. <laughs> it's, you know, I get it. Like you, you don't have to overdo that one. Um, so they come in your house, they sit down and they kind of give you a tutorial. They go right into fire safety discussion. Um, and really set up the need to have this fire alarm in every house, in every room of your house. So they did things like um, they talked about how everything around you was basically a fire hazard. You know, there's all these risks. Um, they had a demo where they're like, okay, you see this, you know, light a match, and they'd have a little, pss, little spritz of an aerosol can, and boom, you know, they could, you could actually see how quickly uh, things become inflamed. And that you can't stop it. You don't have any control over this stuff. If you know, should your house go up in flames? Um, so there's these everyday risks. Um, they wanted to get you present to that idea that everything's a hazard. Um, maybe they offered some statistics, like the incidents of people who die in house fires. You know, something to really scare you. Um, oftentimes in persuasive speeches, remember we did our Aristotle's rhetorical triangle. We looked at pathos and logos and ethos. It, it all matters here. It's all part of the mix. Uh, pathos is really, really important in persuasion. Um, decisions are ultimately made on an emotional basis, right? You can give all the reasons, all the logic, and you need it. You know, people aren't just purely emotional without using their heads. But ultimately, before people will make the sign on the dotted line, they need to be emotionally bought into what you're selling. Um, so emotions are really, really important in selling, you know, insurance or fire alarms in this case. You know, you could play on fear and you could play on, you know, people's, you know, worst case scenario of their family not being protected, which is what they did. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of that, but it sell, believe me that it works. So, um, you know, they'd sell, they would tell relevant stories about, you know, horrible stories. And my dad was even telling me people would cry. And then he was telling me about the kind of pictures that they would use that were just to me unethical. But back then, you know, people, you know, it was, it was one of those things that you can't look away. You just go, wow, this is, this is horrible. I do need to get some sort of, um, you know, protection. And um, then they, they went into the fire laws and, you know, times of change. Are you prepared? And some stories and stats on that. And then they would, you know, of course, all of the facts that um, about sort of this, you know, state of the world, but like have people start to see themselves in the problem. Like, oh my God, I am not prepared. This could happen to me, right? So you're, you're, you're really setting up the situation of, you know, the, this idea that they have this need for any to protect themselves. So what's the, you know, they, they're at this point, fire kills and my family's vulnerable, you know, so now they're kind of tracking with your narrative and you got them at the worst place emotionally. Please watch that video at the end of this deck. As I said, that, um, professor, I don't want to say Yale, um, he kind of walks through the psychology of this model and how now you're at your lowest point when you, when you see the need, you're like, Oh God, this is bleak, you know, please turn it around. And it does, it turn you're, you're, here's the lowest point of your presentation. Everything from this point needs to track up to make the sale. Um, but it's the lower you go, the more people are going, Oh my gosh, my life is, you know, way worse without, it's a terrible place until you give me what it is that I need. So how do you satisfy that need? Well, you know, they go through, they went through like little checklists of all the precautions and actions and things that you could do to protect yourself. Um, you know, check for heat on the door, have an escape route, stay low under smoke. If, you know, so they, they're putting you in the scene, 
right? And then, you know, test your fire alarm. Oh, you don't have one? Well, what do you know? Well, we have these and let me give you a, a demonstration of how this thing works. Now, demonstrations and advertising are truly one of, if you have a superior product or if you have a great new product, one of the best ways to get people to buy into what you're selling. You should show them how it works, right? You see that at Costco all the time. Um, I'm like, oh, I think I need another Vitamix, right? So you're, you're constantly, you know, like, oh yeah, that, 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 that is something that's amazing. And you could really communicate that effectively with a demonstration. Um, so here they did like this features overview. I'm going to show you how it works in a fire. And they'd actually blast that alarm, you know, so people go, whoa, wow, that is really powerful. And then they kind of talk through, this is like a Freon activated piece of equipment. So when the heat would get on it, somehow the Freon would expand and break the seal and the alarm would go off, like this horn would blare. And then people would have pushback. You have to have be ready with your pushback. So don't just like serve it up. I want you just to own it, right? So just like a sales guy would do. People say, what if it's smoke? You know, and so they had a response for that. He said, yeah, you could have a fire without smoke, but you can't have a fire without heat. You know, so in other words, at some point that fire is going to reach this fire extinguisher and you will be warned. All right, so I get it. These fire alarms protect my family. Okay, now we get to the most important part. How did they visualize or help the prospect in this case, you know, visualize the benefits of this in their lives? I already kind of see it. I can imagine it. Help them. Help them over that hump. So what you do, what they did... Um, they did all this just kind of questions and they only would ask questions that they already knew the answer to. And the answer would be something in the affirmative, taking them closer to the sale, right? So do you think this could happen in your home? This kind of a fire, you know, this kind of everyday, you know, coincident or everyday kind of a thing. Yes. Yes, I do. Do you, you know, if you were to have a fire, would it be helpful to have a heads up for that fire? Well, yes, of course. So yes, 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 yes. And she, so they did that kind of a build and people are just starting to imagine, yeah, there's no, the yes is outweigh the any no's. Of course, there's going to be resistance. Of course, South side of Chicago, we didn't have, you know, you're talking to people who don't have a lot of discretionary income and, you know, this, this was not a casual dis decision. It had to be a real, you know, cost benefit analysis going on with them. And you had to help them overcome that with a, really understanding the value of what it was that you were trying to sell. So yeah, visualization, my God, it would be negligent if I didn't have one, right? So this is where they are. You're not telling them that. You're not scolding them for not having it, but they want to get there on their own and you're helping them. And now you want to you want them to act. So what do you do? You know, make the sale. Make the sale now. Funny thing is my dad was telling me because he's he was the demo guy in that, in that sales team with my grandpa. So he got, he did all the, you know, dribbling up to the net kind of thing and boom, boom, boom. And then he passed it over to my grandpa to do the clothes. He's like, and I love that because I would just sit back and I could watch him do the hard part. And I kind of laughed when he just walked me through this case study because um, it shouldn't be the hard part. It should be actually sort of a no brainer if you get, if you did step four correctly, right? No one is going to buy it if you didn't do step four correctly. So, um, you know, you, w one thing is true, and as he said, you don't want to leave their house without, you know, without a sale. So if they, oh, let me think about it, and let, oh, no, 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 there's no thinking about it. Because we all know as salespeople, once you leave, that, that conversation's over. They're not hot leads anymore. They're not really in the moment. And they're not in that, you know, that tipping point. So you got them right there. Now, now, you know, slam dunk that ball, right? Don't, don't walk away from this. Don't be afraid of it. And oftentimes, especially in retail, you want to create some urgency. You got them all this, all this way. You did that whole pitch. Buy now, act now. This is the promotion. This is the reason. You, you, first of all, you can't sleep another night in your house without one of these because who knows, you know, all of the uncertainty that and you know that brings with it. So, you really wanted to have them um, leave with a sale, leave the house with a sale, and they would do things like, okay, well, don't even worry about it. We're going to have all these installed before we leave, and you know they didn't mind sticking around, climbing on ladders, and getting them installed because it made a sale. And of course, they close their loop with getting you know new leads, but we're not going to go into that for this. So, let's go through the 
the full thing, right? So selling fire alarms. Well, fire kills. You have a very serious and important tone here. And, you know, you walk in, you really set up that need, help them feel that their family is vulnerable, satisfy that need. Yeah, gosh, I'm at risk. And this helps protect my family from that risk. Help them visualize, visualize those benefits, right? So it would be negative not to have one. It would be negligent is the word I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, I got to get this, right? So w once you're there, close the deal. So I mean, what do you say? What do you, you want to act? Now, I've seen these presentations, guys. I've seen it where we just kind of do that throwaway thing on point four and five, right? So I, I saw one on fast fashion, which I'm really interested in. Um, and when we got to action, so what do you do when, you know, so fast fashion, it's like if you were to go to, H&M and you get the hottest cutest trend and you got a you know Zara and you got these fa you know fashionable things that are really cute for 2020 and then you know next year it's like oh that's that's yesterday's fashion and so people throw them out you know they throw away their clothes and um, so there's all sorts of things you could do like not shop new but I want you to really go into the action so that you got us convinced that this is a problem now give us all of the real steps and all of the activities um, I had a student just, just kind of drop the ball on the actions. So I'm like, yep, it's all accurate and good. Um, and I'm totally intrigued. I want to do something about it. Help me. That's step five. So, so close a deal could look a little bit harder for, you know, depending what your speech is. Um, but, you know, you want me to, what, shop don't, or adopt don't shop, you know, with a, getting a pet? I got it. Where do I go? Where am I supposed to, you know, how does this work? You know, how much does it cost to help me? You know, so there, there has to be a little bit more hand holding sometimes in the action. Um, so find a topic that first of all speaks to you that you're passionate about. That's where the real win is. Cause that's, those are the topics that you are going to have a, a unique perspective on. You could probably find something that sort of supports your way of thinking stuff that, you know, only, you know, that most of us haven't thought about or thing that's, you know, um, I don't know, just a spin on it. That's yours. Um, find things that are, has a little bit of tension. It doesn't have to be, in fact, it shouldn't be totally polarizing. Um, as I said, if half the class is coming in with a strong opinion on that topic already, um, or it's real, they're really positional about it, I assure you, in six to eight minutes, you're not going to change anybody's mind. So that's a bad topic for the speech, right? Um, there are some topics, as I spoke about on Friday, that I don't allow only because it's not the right format. It's not the right platform, right? It's not the right place. You only have eight minutes. You think, you know, if we can't figure that out in broader culture, you know, in, in 50 years of my life, then I assure you, you're not going to figure it out in the little window you have to present. So be choiceful, you know, think it through, find an angle that doesn't, isn't off-putting, but yet um, has some tension on, on both sides. Um, if you're not sure, shoot me an email. I'm happy to help you. And like I said, go ahead and check out this fine guy's uh, video on YouTube. I found it pretty helpful and I hope you do too. All right. Talk to you soon.